Howdy, y'all. Welcome back. One of the strangest mysteries that arises when we truly begin to attempt to decipher the roots of mankind are the inconsistencies, the anomalies, and the downright miraculous instances of ingenuity which appear to occur simultaneously on vastly separated kingdoms across the earth. Of the most genuinely interesting concepts in ancient architecture worth taking a second look at, a topic which has a history that appears to confound and confuse even the most avid of scholars, the arch would have to be the most mysterious and possibly the most influential of this architecture. For centuries, even before recorded history, throughout kingdoms separated by thousands of miles, in the most ancient and revered structures, we can find examples of the arch. What makes the arch so riveting and truly so unexplainable is the fact that a true arch, like the ones found worldwide, all consist of the same major aspects, no matter how big or small the arch may be. The arch is a pure compression form. To create an arch is to have the perfect mathematical equation in place, to have a sophisticated knowledge of the key pieces which constitute an arch and their exact needed measurements in relation to the other pieces. Every masonry arch consists of nine integral aspects, which must be achieved for the arch to be fully functional, including the keystone. For every major kingdom in the world to simultaneously or within a very short period of time relative to the history of mankind, gain knowledge on how to construct perfect arches in this manner is nothing short of miraculous, unless perhaps these earliest great kingdoms, which themselves gained their notoriety partially due to this architecture, actually had the same teachers. The current narrative history regarding the nature of the arch is lacking, and that's due in part to so many different kingdoms and the historians who study them claiming that the true arch originated in their specific space of the world. And trying to claim or decipher who built the first true arch is to do the architectural concept an injustice. The fact of the matter is that in all of these photographs that we're looking at today, whether the building is 200 years old or 2000 years old, we can identify the same form of an arch. Our question shouldn't be who built it first, but rather how did all of these get built in unison? The concept of the arch since the beginning of written history appears to go hand in hand with that of the brick. We're told the first true arches on record could be found in ancient Mesopotamia, dating to the second millennium BC in the massive brick architecture of that kingdom. However, much like the domes which we've discussed heavily in my previous videos, the current narrative tells us that the arch architecture, which we're also familiar with today, was brought to the forefront by none other than the Romans, in a term deemed the quote, Roman architectural revolution. We're told while savagely conquering the greater part of the known world at that time, the Romans would frequently incorporate aspects of the conquered people into their own beliefs, thus creating the amalgamation of many cultures that was Rome. One way they did this was by converting the cities and towns that they captured into ones which resembled the largest cities that were already part of Rome. The Romans would use fine brickwork, often built directly upon earlier major structures, and create buildings fitting of the Roman title. This meant building arches. Essentially, we're led to believe the Romans erected their cities using techniques inherited in their many travels. These Roman cities would be built from brick, always incorporating an arch and a dome to help identify these cities as now under Roman rule. In doing so, the Romans are said to have perfected the somewhat secret architectural concept of the East, allowing for structures with arches to be made with rather convenient methods for the first time in history. The development of the Roman arch, according to this narrative, not only led to massive arches appearing worldwide, but it also led to the first major guilds of architects, masons, being founded in the Roman land. During the age of Augustus, for example, nearly the entire city of Rome, as well as countless smaller cities of the empire, were nearly entirely rebuilt. This caused a humongous influx of architects from around the world to flock to Rome. Many who ended up staying here, starting families, and beginning generations of architects that would become the major masonry guilds. However, can we truly believe that Rome alone was responsible for bringing the arch to the world? 
Meaning, could Rome really, according to this current narrative, have inherited this concept of the arch from the Etruscans, as they did with many other things, and quickly, in a matter of centuries, spread the perfect arch to all corners of the world? To the point we are still discovering and excavating and unveiling ancient arches today. Or, could we look through the brief history of the arch found worldwide and see that the narrative given today actually appears to not only drive a big question mark into the overall Roman narrative, but it also leaves us with a lot of big question marks regarding the arch as well. For example, in the Bronze Age, we have true arches appearing throughout the Near East, including the Nippur Arch, built roughly 6,000 years ago. In Iraq, on Tel Taya, there is a mud brick structure with an arched entrance constructed at least 4,000 years ago. We have a multitude of true arches being founded in the ancient Canaanite kingdom, including the gates of Ashkelon and Tel Dan, both dated to nearly 4,000 years ago. In Iran, at Haftep, is another arched vault dating to 1500 BC. The arch was present in classical Greece and ancient Persia as well. The 4th century BC Greek Rhodes footbridge made use of a true arch and barrel vault archways arose all around ancient Persia, with Tak Khazra at Tessaphon being not only the most famous in that area, but also the largest freestanding arch until modern times, having been constructed in the 6th century AD or earlier. Interestingly, we're told ancient China was replete with archways as well. However, since most of the ancient Chinese architecture was made out of wood, the evidence of early Chinese arches actually comes to us from other forms of artwork which depicted the buildings with the arches. This includes many stone carved reliefs showing structures with massive arches in China. The most famous example that still stands today in China is the Anji Bridge, a stone arch bridge built in roughly 600 AD. It is the oldest open spandrel segment bridge in the entire world. In Africa, we have examples of arches in the kingdom of Aksum as well, modern day Ethiopia. These arches date to the third century or earlier. In India, we're told vaulted arch roofs were found in semi-buried ancient structures dating to 1900 BC from the Cemetery H culture. However, more concrete evidence of the true arches of India can be seen in the Batargian Temple, founded 450 AD, and the Mahabadi Temple, founded roughly 600 AD. The arches of India were vast, but they became even more intricate and substantial after the Islamic conquest of the 12th century. Finally, we even have arches in ancient indigenous America as well. Most of these arches exist on buried sites or in burial mounds, on sites that were revered by the local populations but were often not occupied. While many of the early indigenous American arches appear similar to the others found around the world and showcased in the video, we're told one of the best and most recently discovered examples would have to be the massive arch-roofed passageway that runs beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent in central Mexico. This arch passageway beneath the Aztec Pyramid has not been fully excavated or even seen by the human eye before, but was only discovered in the year 2010 with the use of ground-penetrating radar and robotics. Nowadays, we don't often see things like multiple story homes which go the extra mile and incorporate a true arch. Furthermore, 
Even many modern, richly adorned cities and structures, such as the schools, hospitals, stadiums, places of worship, places of defense, the forts that are being built nowadays, do not incorporate the arch anymore. What was once seemingly found on every major building around the world, an aspect of masonry which seemed to denote more than just architecture, but an importance, has now been left behind for the cold steel walls we are accustomed to. The arch, with countless references in biblical texts, mathematical treaties all related to the arch, and historical hypothesis being a shape which not only denoted quality, but literally sustained itself, has in our modern time given way for steel triangles of the future. Sure, a triangle might be considered the strongest shape in all of the earthly architectural realm, but a true arch was the most historic, the most discussed, the most repeated, the most attested to, the most sought after, and the most critical. Just look at any major kingdom from around the world before the year 1900. Look at the oldest photographs. Look at the streets, the walls, the capitals, the accentuation, the alignment, and the mathematics behind the glory of the architecture. No matter what city it is you're looking at, no matter what building it is you're looking at, if the building is considered to be a major landmark of that city, you will find an arch. These are the rules of masonry. They were constructed entirely unrelated in these kingdoms found all throughout the world. The only thing that ties them together is this architecture. We see the same exact general principles, the same mathematics, the same concepts being fulfilled as if it was destiny. But in the end, it's really just the arch.